Hey everybody and welcome back to Transit Tangents. My name is Chris. And I'm Lewis. And today we are diving into every transit nerd's favorite topic to complain about and that is the lack of high-speed rail in the U.S. Yeah, um, you know, fortunately uh, to try to, I'm usually the one who's all doom and gloom, but I'm going to put the <laughs> positive spin right now. Uh, we have two projects that are kind of, sort of, almost high-speed rail in the U.S. that we'll start off talking about. Uh, we're then going to get into a couple projects that are uh, actually under construction. Ground has been broken, some of them for many years, uh, some of them just recently. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, uh, some of the, what many of us will probably just think of as pipe dream plans uh, that are actually in planning stages. Um, and then we'll also just kind of get into, you know, what what would we do? What would we like to see uh, moving forward if the U.S. can actually pull it off? RM Transit uh, had referred to sort of like silly boondoggles as like gadget bond. I Yo. think we should refer to these as like vapor bond. Vapor bond. Like oh, they the, just the, the, the plans. Yeah, in the future they're just that gonna are, yeah. fade away. I, like water vapor. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> um, before we get into that, uh, do you have any experience with the high speed rail line? Uh, so last summer, um, it's the first time I'd ever, the first and only time I've ever been to Europe. Uh, and in Italy, I got to take the high speed rail. Uh, between Florence and Rome, um, and it was lovely. It How was, fast does that go? It's fast, yeah. um, and it's it's hours faster than driving. The nice. the difference between um, and what I couldn't get over was actually how smooth it felt while you were mm -hmm. on it doing it. So that's my only experience with it. Have you ridden high speed rail anywhere? Um, well, my only experience is going to be uh, with one of the projects we're going to talk about. Ah, so I okay. will I can we'll save, save it, it until, we, until okay. we get started. But um, yeah, I've had I've had one experience. It was mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, which really only leaves one, two, two, two options. Two potential so. <laughs> options. Uh, and I think I know which one it's going to be. I guess yeah. the first one we're going to talk about is, and if I'm being honest, this feels like a stretch, um, but Acela, the Acela yeah. line in the U.S. run by Amtrak, kind of running through the Northeast Corridor, is one of the closest things we have to high-speed rail. Um, is this the one that you have experience with? Yes. Okay. So, I've never ridden it, so I'm curious. Yeah, so I, I had to work in D.C. Uh, for a couple, a couple jobs ago, and I flew to New York the weekend before I had to go to work, mm -hmm. saw some friends, uh, and then took a very, very late train. I think it was at like 11 p.m. or 12 p.m. Uh, I took a very late train from New York and arrived in... Uh, DC in the morning and it was the Acela uh, which is technically a high-speed rail for the US um, for those of you not familiar with the Acela it is a uh, Amtrak line that runs from Boston to Washington DC mm -hmm. it's uh, around 460 or so uh, miles of track mm -hmm. and it can reach top speeds of up to about 150 miles an hour which right. technically classifies it as a high-speed rail right the caveat to that is it only reaches uh, the, that speed, that 150 miles per hour, in about 50 miles of track. Right. So it's high speed for a very short time. Right. And the, the average speed overall is uh, 62 miles per hour on it. So, yes. I mean, it's it's at least moving yeah. pretty quick. And for the average speed, again, you're for a lot of it, you're going to be going over that. But, um, you know, le leave some room left to be desired. Uh and again, it, may, it makes stops in like so many major cities along the way and would be a fantastic candidate for real high speed rail. It's just tricky because the areas are so densely populated at this point that like there'd be a lot of eminent domain, lots of that sort of stuff having to uh, take place to to make that happen, basically. But the Acela train, it's been uh, active since about uh, 2000. And uh, we, as of 2024, are getting uh, brand new trains mm. for the Acela line. Nice. And some of the funding for this is coming through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. But these new trains um, allow the Acela to go up to about 160 miles an hour. So not a huge difference in mm -hmm. speed. Uh, but it also comes with several track improvements as well to, I think, lengthen the amount of time you can right. go with that and speed. And I think some of these new trains have some of the technology that I actually experienced in Italy when I was riding their high-speed rail that allow the trains to, like, bank a little bit on some of the turns and whatnot, which allows you to have higher-speed trains on rails that might not be perfect for it in the long run. But um, one other thing I want to touch on Excella and just Amtrak in the Northeast Corridor in general is uh, it's sort of the prime example of, of how... Uh, high-speed rail should work in the U.S. and mm -hmm. the fact that it's it sort of is dedicated to that line or mm -hmm. the line is dedicated to the Acela. Um, in most of the U.S., we share passenger and freight lines. Mm -hmm. uh, the passenger rail or the sorry, the freight rail companies own 
all the of the railroad yeah, yeah, in yeah. the U.S. So the Acela doesn't have to yield to freight traffic, right. which allows them to have continuous service and to reliable schedules, reliable schedule, sort of and, and to yeah. get up to those speeds. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Hope, it would be great to see that in other routes in the U.S. Um, well, and I think we are starting to see that in other routes in some uh, some private investment. Yeah, and I actually think some of this might be shared too, but uh, they've at least worked on some scheduling. This is kind of a, a different scenario. So obviously, the Acela is run by Amtrak. Um, if you're watching this, you've definitely heard of Brightline. Uh, Brightline currently operates a close to high speed rail in Florida. Again, it's higher speed rail, we'll call yeah. it, um, between Miami and now it all the way connects to Orlando. I think to um, Orlando's international airport. Gotcha. Yep. Um, and again, this is a privately owned rail company in the U.S., mm-hmm. which is a rarity for the U.S. at this stage in the game, <laughs> <Nowadays>. but it, <laughs> it used to be kind of how all of this worked. Yeah. Um, and uh the construction on that began in 2014 service started in 2018 so only a four-year construction period which is pretty impressive for these sorts of projects if i'm being honest especially when we get into some of the projects we're going to talk about in a little bit um and the top speed on these trains is 125 miles per hour um but similar to uh the acela the top speed unfortunately is not being uh, utilized for the entire trip. Uh, in Brightline's case, a lot of it has to do with at-grade crossings. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can only go so fast when you're going through densely populated areas yeah, and crossing you're, streets. You're and... limited to about 110 miles an hour on rail mm-hmm. when passing through the, the level crossings or grade That's crossings. That's still pretty freaking fast. So that the, is fast, that but is not it's, the but necessarily it's still... the reason to yeah. slow it down because the average speed on these are 69 miles per hour. Right. Um, something, though, that I think is interesting about Brightline that fails to happen in so much other rail in the u.s is the kind of time comparison so while bright line in florida is not technically high speed rail i don't mm. know what the actual threshold on miles per hour is but about 150 150 and these are the max is 125 um i found a, a chart that we'll make sure we put up here that kind of shows the difference in travel times uh, between driving and mm. taking bright line between different segments of the uh, route at different times of day actually uh, and at the kind of peak traffic times in some of these areas Brightline ends up beating driving by 30 percent in time savings which is significant no that's like, absolutely significant and i would i would definitely lean on the train over driving in that case right and especially you know to be totally transparent here that doesn't mean you're getting destination to destination 30 percent faster because you then still have a little bit of travel time on either side but if your destinations are fairly close to train stations and or you want to be able to get some work done while you're doing it instead of, you know, being behind the wheel, you can have your laptop out, mm-hmm. be working on things. The videos and stuff I see, the, the Brightline trains, they're really nice. The stations are really nice. So um, it to me, it's like there is a the the time economics work for Brightline where they don't on like the vast majority of train lines in the United States, which is an issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing that I am curious about with the bright line is sort of the cost mm-hmm. and the the time benefit versus, let's say, flying. Right. Uh, because sometimes when you look at Amtrak flights or Amtrak... Uh, Amtrak flights. Amtrak... Uh, they're diversifying. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when you look at Amtrak trips, uh, they're a little more expensive than I would expect them to be. And, and they take longer. <laughs> and I would, I would expect bright line being a private company to also be mm-hmm. more expensive than Amtrak. Right. Um, but we just looked it up. Yeah, we just looked it up. And I is so just for context, we looked up uh, like it's about a, a little over a week in advance just for like a midweek, like a Wednesday journey. And on Brightline, there's uh, the, the cheapest ones are thirty nine dollars. Yeah. For, and this is the full length from Miami all the way to Orlando. Um, the highest one that I see on here, there is one that's one hundred and forty nine dollars. Um, but that is uh, like leaving right at 5.45 p.m. My guess is that train might be full or something. So depending on how far in advance you book and the time of day, if you're flexible, um, you can do it as for as little as $39 and have it take three hours and 30 minutes uh, from station to station, which yeah. is actually like a good time wise too especially when you consider you know i guess let's get into the airport comparison on price yeah, so, we can talk so, about so if we compare it to an airport let's say we're flying non-stop from miami to uh orlando you can do it cheaply mm-hmm. um with spirit airlines okay 
Uh, but you can do it to, for the, about seventy two dollars. Seventy two dollars, but that is no no bags either. That so is that with, is no bags. It comes with other fees. Yeah. Everybody knows the whole thing with Spirit. With, with Spirit. Yeah. But um, it's about seventy two dollars, and it's an hour and eight minutes hour to go minutes. from Miami to mm-hmm. uh, Orlando. However, as soon as you get past Spirit and you're looking at um, other airlines like American or Delta, then you're looking at one hundred and forty one bucks. Right, and so, the, that hour and nine minutes is also just plane to plane i mean you figure you're showing up at the airport an hour and a half or yeah. I mean, it, depending on which airport and time of day and all that sort of stuff at least an hour and a half early so that's the florida bright line and uh we're not done talking about bright line but we're going to skip on to an- another one here first uh because we're now shifting into routes that are currently under construction in the u.s so uh really only bright line and the acela are our closest things to high-speed yeah. rail that we have today um now we're getting into the Two projects that likely will be open next. One of them, maybe I'm less convinced that it'll be open next. But <sighs> yeah, um, the first the, one. Yeah, go ahead. The, <laughs> the first one is the California High Speed Rail. Mm-hmm. Hey, Gondola Gang, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We're going to jump right back in in just a second. But first, if you like what you're hearing, we just want to make sure that you are hitting that subscribe button. Uh, like the video if you haven't done so already. And we also love reading your comments. So please leave a comment. If you're listening, please consider giving us a rating, preferably five stars. I I hope you think we deserve it, um, but I'll let you be the judge of that. I'll take four with a comment. And California High Speed Rail is the example project for anybody who has something negative to say about public transit, Mm -hmm. about government funded projects or publicly funded projects. It's it's not looking great right and frankly like we're going to talk some shit about it a little bit yeah. but like i think both of us would love to see it done oh 100 you know like they are trailblazing to try to do this they're the first ones to try to do this sort of thing in the u.s but yeah there's a lot of issues so a little context on the high, on the california high-speed rail um this is a project that was initially uh approved by california voters in 2008 uh, to a price tag of about $33 billion. Mm-hmm. That was the estimated cost. Uh, and the, the track would run from San Francisco to Los Angeles with um, some additional expansions to go to um, Sacramento and eventually mm-hmm. to San Diego. This would be an amazing project for the state of California to connect this sort of central California corridor. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there's... Uh, I'm trying to think of how many people live in that corridor, but California is home to nearly 40 million people. Yeah. Um, so we're talking a larger population mm-hmm. and a larger economy than most countries right. at this point. Yes. Uh, so this would be a major infrastructure um, uh, achievement to be able to connect all of these communities. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but what has happened in reality <laughs> yeah. is, a, is kind of a different story. I mean, yeah, here we are 17 years after this was approved and... There are, I mean, there are sections that have been built, um, but not even full. I mean, there's no tracks on those sections yet. You have, you know, some stretches of bridges and things like that. This has been caught up in environmental reviews for, I mean, years and years and years. Um, The cost has ballooned from the initial $33 billion to... Right now, I think we're sitting at 128 billion. That's the high estimate. So up to 128 billion. Right. Um, and at that, uh, we have only uh, we're only estimating beginning service around 2030 to 2033 for right. a very small section of the track. So 2033 on something that was voter approved in 2008. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of <laughs> of example projects other than like the U.S. Highway Program, which was just a massive undertaking. Mm-hmm. Um, most rail projects in the country from the time that they were approved and started to the time of their operation didn't take this long. Like when you think about um, major city infrastructure projects in the early 1900s. Right. And I mean, again, I don't want to like, I don't want to disparage this too much because again, I think it is an important project. However, like the the Bright Line Florida example, like that was four years from announcement to revenue service beginning. Uh, I'm not expecting this to take four years because this is a much bigger undertaking. But maybe twelve years, you know, twelve years. Twelve years from voter approval would be it opened in well, 2020. I will say this: <laughs> uh, the California project comes with a lot of challenges. Um, not all of those are uh, not all of those are human challenges. Some of them are just environmental. You have to build a system that has some type of future proofing for earthquakes, mm-hmm. right? 
you have to build uh, through pretty difficult terrain. Mm -hmm. Some of this is through farmland and valley. A lot of right. this is through mountainous terrain. Florida's flat as a pancake. There's yeah. areas that have to cross water. Like it, it is um, geographically much, much, much mm -hmm. more challenging than in Florida. But I would hope, though, okay, the geographic stuff, yes, very valid. You would hope in a state like California, where the political will should be so behind this, that they would be able to make this shit happen sooner. And, like, if it's going to take this long in California, I just worry about what it would look like in other in other places. I don't know. Well, um, funny you should mention that. So, yes, political will for public transit, absolutely high in California right. at the yeah, moment. Yeah. Um, political will for uh, environmental protection. Mm, tricky. Yeah. A little higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the big challenges for the California rail is uh, over the 500 miles of it, uh, they essentially have to get every tiny little section yeah. environmentally approved. Mm -hmm. And that comes with a lot of, of hoops and hurdles to get through mm -hmm. uh, with California environmental protection laws. Right. So that has also been a uh, major um, driver of delays mm -hmm. for this project. And I don't think that those are necessarily a bad thing. However, when we talk about projects like high-speed rail, which are fundamentally better for the environment than, driving, say, building right. a 14 lane highway right. from California to or from uh, uh, LA, LA to San Francisco, yeah. then we should be streamlining the environmental process. We also had some issues with the project management at the start. Mm -hmm. uh, they did start construction a little earlier than they should have, um, which is really difficult to say. Um, but there were some project management hurdles and getting things organized and, mm -hmm. and really starting to take off. So the project has started to pick up steam and start moving forward. And I think with the environmental studies finally, uh, for the most part, being cleared, I think there were like 99% of them cleared. Mm -hmm. I do expect the California high-speed rail to start making significant progress. Mm -hmm. That's at least, for, and for everything I've read, that's what I hope so. I feel like is going to happen. I hope so. We will see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I mean, again, I, I did... They are truly, like, breaking ground doing this for the first time in the United States. Like, this is going to be like a bullet train. Yeah, there that's are, another yeah, important fact like to the, include the, there. the Bright Line ones, again, these are not necessarily true high-speed rail. The, the one we talked about already, the next one, I think, will cross that threshold. But, like, we don't have bullet trains in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, not even close. Um, this would be the first true bullet train going over 200 miles an hour, being able to keep at that speed for the vast yeah. majority of the route. And that's why this is more difficult. Like, they're doing this for the first time on the continent, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the supply chains weren't there, all this sort of stuff. Um, that's not an excuse for all of this. In my opinion, this is still taking way too freaking long. And if this was some sort of private endeavor, it, I mean... The, oh, it would be out of business. It would, There's it would no be way. out of business. Or, like, people would have been fired such a long yeah. time ago, and people would have been replaced in and, and yeah. had it been done. Again, we'll talk about private versus public in a little bit because yeah. there's pros and cons to both of them. I'm not necessarily like private for all of this, but yeah. uh, another project that actually just broke ground last month in April 2024 uh, is Brightline West now. Mm -hmm. So we talked about Brightline in Florida. Uh, Brightline West is a route that would go from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Um, it, uh, yeah, like I said, broke ground in 2024 here. And ambitious plans for this to be open by the Olympics in 2028. Um, I, I am holding my breath that that actually happens. We'll see. I mean, so to be fair, they do have a little bit of precedent that they opened their last one in Florida within four years. Yeah. Um, this one actually has a, a better kind of metric for the right of way the whole time. This one is mostly running in a highway median slash along the side of a highway, mm -hmm. um, which is a decent model. I mean, a lot of this is running through the desert. Yep. Um, I don't actually don't know the highway number off the top of my head. I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's basically a straight shot for the most part. Uh, there's one section where it goes through a bit of like a mountainous terrain, but, uh, so the Brightline Florida one was only 125. This one will actually have top speeds of 200 miles per hour, um, which is, I mean, that's fast. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, really yeah. fast. Um, it would be, it would be a major achievement to have that built in four years. And if that is the case, the California high speed rail people need to hire these folks after. Yeah, no kidding. Come, come help. And I think that that uh, similar to San Francisco to LA from the California high speed rail, which I think would be about three and a half hours or mm -hmm. so once you factor in the train, maybe about three hours. Mm -hmm. Um, the Vegas to LA also about three hours. Yeah, it's time competitive. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but uh, City Nerd did a, actually an interesting video that we'll uh, link in the description whether you're watching or listening to this. Um, actually comparing the travel differences between driving, flying, and taking the bright mm -hmm. line. 
And he, he also did the comparisons of like, realistically, you don't live next to the train station. So where in LA would it make sense for you to live to be able to connect to it? Because yeah. this doesn't go to downtown LA right no. now. It's going to Rancho Cucamonga or something. That's a fun name. I don't know if I said it right or wrong. but uh, And then you'd have to use Metrolink to connect from downtown yeah. LA. Um, definitely an interesting project. Also, the funding estimate is $12 billion for it, which doesn't seem that... Sounds like a steal. Yeah, it, it does sound like a steal. And uh, some folks might remember three-ish billion of it was actually uh, funded in the one of the infrastructure bills mm-hmm. uh, passed under this administration. Um, so some of the money is coming from the federal government. Um, but the vast majority, so what is that? Twenty percent coming from the federal government, the rest uh, coming from uh, kind of private equity yeah. in, involved in Brightline. And I would um, certainly expect the cost to go up a little bit before it's finished. But twelve billion to connect these two major U.S. cities with a train is, that goes two hundred miles an hour is amazing. Yeah, <laughs> so I am all for Brightline. You can build trains wherever you want at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is really impressive. Uh, one of the the uh, things that makes this project a little bit easier we talked about before this episode and that was the fact that the train runs in the median of a major u.s highway Mm -hmm. so the environmental impacts the environment excuse me the environment (laughs) the environmental impact thank you wow uh the environmental impact studies uh are probably a little easier to Mm -hmm. complete because it's already running down the middle of a u.s highway right so you're not really changing the environment much around this Mm -hmm. um all that being said i'm still confused and shocked and very curious about how they get through their planning stage so much faster totally than a government entity does yeah yeah no so I, I worth worth diving into there's honestly we should do a bright line episode at some point i, I don't want to get into this too much right now but also like how they are justifying like making these profitable a lot of it has mm-hmm. to do with real estate before they do these they're buying up real estate around their stations and really you know building hotels and uh stores and all this sort of stuff having space for rentals for selling the land afterwards um, there's kind of all sorts of different things to their model, which could be a positive thing moving forward, or they might flop at some point, but at least the infrastructure is there and the, yeah. we could potentially still take advantage of it. Lastly, we're yeah. going to talk about, uh, we, we talked, we covered existing high-speed rail in the U S we are talked about the two that are currently under construction. Let's talk a little bit about a few other projects that are in the pipe dream phase the, of the vapor bond. and praying vapor bond, vapor bond phase. Um, one of them is close to home to us here, Texas central. Uh, this one would be a bullet train. Yeah. Would be. I don't. I, it's it's funny to talk about it in that way because like yeah. we don't. They don't. It if, could, it, if it happens, it would be a bullet train. Um, we're talking about a route from Houston to Dallas, which mm-hmm. has been a priority corridor for a very long time. Yes. I mean, we've been talking about uh, this this rail connection between this, these two cities uh, for many decades, but the Texas Central entity, the one that wants to build this mm-hmm. railroad. Um, is called it was uh, founded in 2012 yeah. so since 2012 we've been actively working to build this corridor yeah and they've run into all sorts of issues with uh you know trying to purchase land in between uh not being allowed to use eminent domain now maybe being allowed to use eminent domain um yeah. the actual like uh texas central itself kind of like almost disbanded at one point or something yep. it seemed like and a lot of management yeah switch overs and... Um, and then in the last year though in 2023 uh amtrak announced that they're going to partner with texas central to try to make this happen yeah i think um, the partnership is still in discussion and, and what that's going to look like in the long term mm-hmm. um but yeah with with the federal government and amtrak sort of getting back behind this project mm-hmm. uh, i think we might actually see a little bit of progress moving forward and mm-hmm. as you touched on with the eminent domain uh, there were several lawsuits preventing them from actually accessing certain ranches to mm-hmm. do surveying for the project. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court in 2012 ruled in favor mm-hmm. of Texas Central that they can use eminent domain and mm-hmm. officially classified them as a rail company because right. that was one of the sticking points. That was in points. 2022, not 2012, just to, right? Yes, yeah. right, 2022. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what year it is. So in, in 2022, they, uh, to pick up on your thought, yeah. in 2022, uh, that was resolved in the Texas Supreme Court, and now eminent domain can be used in those yeah. instances uh, on those specific ranches that were holding out, essentially, and saying, no, we can't do this. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court surprisingly ruled in favor uh, that, that this could actually happen. So yeah. that's another hurdle that is crossed there. Uh, the I am estimated... a little sad that oh, it doesn't go through Austin. Yeah. Um, but the Texas Central did put out a revised map that showed uh, a Dallas to Houston um, and a spur going from Austin to College Station, yeah. which I'm sure yeah. would be a much later addition. But 
And who knows, we might end welcome. up with a bright line or something like that, yeah. doing the other side, Dallas to San Antonio and whatnot. But um, estimated cost, though, for this Texas Central project, up to $40 billion. Um, who the hell knows, though? Who knows? Uh, yeah. And then what, one other kind of proposed project that's been discussed is up in the Pacific Northwest, a uh, route doing Vancouver to Seattle to Portland to Oregon. Um, and this is another major corridor. So when we... When we're talking about uh, doing high-speed rail projects in the U.S., we're looking at these city pairs or city groupings that are close enough together that you really don't have to fly between them. Yeah. The Texas Triangle, you know, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Houston, major major potential for that. Mm-hmm. Very similar in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Vancouver, Portland, uh, and or excuse me, Vancouver, Seattle, and Portland. Yeah. Uh, three major major cities, huge population centers. Yeah. There's no reason you should have to fly between them. Yep. Yeah. And unfortunately, just like so much other stuff that we've seen, though, this was designated a high speed rail corridor in 1992. Yeah. Uh, here we are, uh, 32 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it's a pipe dream plan at this point. So. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's exciting to kind of talk about these future ideas like Texas and Pacific Northwest. And I think both of those are really valid projects that really yep. should have the funding put into them. Um, but the question is, is like, who can pull them off? What is the best way to do them? And like, is, is the best model to do it kind of through the government building these lines and running these lines through Amtrak yeah. or to have companies like Brightline be doing it. And I mean, yeah. that, this could be a discussion for a whole episode, frankly, but I mean, it's, it's tricky when you see how fast Brightline got their Brightline line in Florida running and how fast they're at least planning to do this one in California to, to, to Vegas. Yeah. They don't it, it announce in 1992 and then wait 30 you know, years, <laughs> 30 right, years to, to, to actually start. Right. And it's, um, yeah, yeah it, it just like, it, it makes me a little interested in like how it should happen because like, I, I think in a perfect world, like the U S could nationalize the railroads and you could use existing right of ways and you could make some of these at least higher speed trains happen all over the place. And if that were the perfect world we lived in, I would say do it. But we're nowhere anywhere close to having the political will right, to doing any of that. Well, I mean, I, I will, I'm, I, kidding, I, I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. I, I know it, but a lot of people. Someone will probably be like, "Oh, that is communism." It's, it's like, okay, uh, like highways are socialist. Uh, uh, yeah, the yeah, fire yeah. station is socialist. Yeah, like yeah. you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Someone will inevitably leave that. I know you're joking, but I just it, it makes sense. I mean, like England's railroads are nationalized. Like they're not like a you know what i mean like we don't call england socialist i mean some people probably do but like they've got conservative prime minister (laughs) it's it's so it's i don't know uh who should be building these who should be running these can amtrak like effectively run these i don't know i don't know i'm usually a big fan of of larger government programs honestly but when it comes to this sort of interconnected cities and this this transit these transit projects while i would love to see public support and, and U.S. government support in, in building these. Mm-hmm. Um, historically, it has been private enterprise, a private enterprise that has built railroads and connected cities. Mm-hmm. And if that is the model we have to move toward in the future to get this connectivity, then I'm all for it. Yeah. I just want the trains to be built. Yeah, yeah I think I agree with that 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I think it's totally fine also. Like, I, you know, it's fun to see these maps on Twitter and elsewhere of like, the U.S. high-speed rail network and having mm-hmm. rails crisscrossing the entire country. And while I think that that vision is so cool, I, I think that piecemealing and focusing on these city pairs that definitely work, that will that should, you know, the whether it be the Texas Triangle, whether it be Portland and, and mm-hmm. Seattle, whether it be uh, Vegas and, and uh, L.A., whether it be, like, the, in North Carolina, there's plenty of city pairs that would work. I would I would rather see these kind of, like, Areas that are going to be a slam dunk, get done, have people ride yeah. them, have people love them to get to the point where like, oh, now like we don't have to fight for the political will to build this larger network. People are just going to want to do it. It's going to be so overwhelmingly popular once people realize how good it is yeah. that they're going to want to do it. Yeah. I don't know if we'll ever reach a place where you can do LA to New York without flying. Right. Right. But also that's not what we want. Right. But it's, we're still going to fly that even right. if there is a train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just want to be able to go to our neighboring city. Yeah. I would love to hop a train uh, to go to, to San Antonio and be able to come back, you know, with with the train moving every 20 minutes. Right. You know, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, yeah, it doesn't have to be some massive, massive undertaking. But, yeah. um, 
Well, that should give you a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let us know uh, in the comments or shoot us an email uh, of what city pairs you would like to see. Uh, if there's any important uh, high-speed rail projects that we didn't touch on mm-hmm. and you want us to touch on in a future episode, um, maybe eventually we'll go to Florida. I we'll ride, ride the, the Bright Line. Yeah, yeah we'll yeah, ride yeah. The, the Bright Line from uh, Miami to Orlando. And if anybody's down there who's watching, come join us yeah, on that we can, trip. We can record an episode on the train. Yeah. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for watching. If you haven't liked this video or left a comment, please definitely do so. If you're listening on a podcast platform, if you could give us a five-star rating, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your Transit Tangent Tuesday. Yeah, I'm saving that dough. Public transit's where it's at. Watch me go.